to, to here in Geneva, and I'm very happy to welcome to our new XDX data set deep dive. My name is Javier Teran. I work for the Center for Humanitarian Data, and I'm based here in Geneva. This time we are hosting the International Organization for Migration. And as you know, uh, the displacement tracking matrix team is the main source of data, not only to understand the scale and the shape of displacement within a country, but also to derive insights from their data sets that can lead to identify durable solutions for internal displacement. IUM DTM team joined XDX since 2014, and since then the IUM DTM has been sharing a lot of data sets on the platform. In our session today, we will learn a lot from the work of the DTM teams, what they do, how they collect the data, how they curate it, how they aggregate it, and also very important, how they disseminate it, how they share it, platforms such as the humanitarian data exchange. This session will be recorded and will be available soon after the end of the webinar on our YouTube channel. Uh, the chat box if ready open colleagues so feel free to comment to introduce yourself and to share your experience on using xcx at the end of the webinar we have prepared a small poll a small survey just to get um, uh, your feedback about the webinars and in that way we can improve uh, these webinars from now on uh Godfrey, can we have the next slide please to, uh, the agenda for today, we will start with some opening remarks from Dr. Coco Barner. Then we, we're going to present the work of the center and also IOM presence on XCX. Then we have an introduction of the work of IOM DTM teams. And then soon after that, we're going to go deep dive into the DTM's data sets. At the end, I will reserve uh, a good uh, amount of time. We'll have Q&A, so I hope you can interact with us. Uh, now let me introduce the presenters, the panelists for today's session. So we have Dr. Coco Varner, who is the director of IOM's Global Data Institute. She will be followed by Laura Nistri, who is the Global DTM Coordinator. We have as well Isa Song Nava, DTM Information Management Officer at IOM. And also we have Victoria Niawara, uh, DTM Coordinator in Mozambique. Meti, uh, Metasevia Salu, data manager at, uh, at XDX in, in our team, will be also participating. I think with this, I give the floor to Dr. Coco Barner for your opening remarks. The floor is yours, Dr. Barner. Thank you so much, Javi. Hi, everyone. It's great to be with you, and thank you for the invitation. Also, in some ways, uh, Happy birthday cel celebration of 10 years of HDX, and it's really good um, to be with you. Um, many of you know that IOM is home to the displacement tracking matrix, and we're longtime partners with HDX. Of course, OCHA is one of our main partners in our world, and this community has um, an ever crucial role, and particularly in times when conflict and strife are increasing in the world. I just also wanted to applaud our efforts together and all of your efforts, collecting, cleaning, making data available for life-saving operations. We're grateful and your work is really irreplaceable. Collaboration with partners, like the OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data is a key part of how we deliver on the work that I just mentioned. HDX, which celebrates its 10th anniversary this year, happy birthday, happy anniversary. It's an incredible achievement. HDX has been a real joint collaboration and effort in terms of how humanitarian data is accessed and shared with the sector. And the work has transformed what is now expected in terms of data availability for almost any given response and crisis. This is reflected well in the center's latest state open humanitarian data report, which estimates that 70% of relevant complete crisis data is available across the 23 major humanitarian operations as monitored through the HDX data grids. 
For IOM's Global Data Institute, our top priority, as many of you know, and maybe some of you have heard from our Director General Pope, is to save lives and deliver solutions through data. And that's our contribution. I'm really pleased to see the strategic importance of data increasingly recognized in our sector. Last week, for example, the independent review from ODI, the Interagency Standing Committee's Humanitarian Response to Internal Displacement was published. Some of you may have seen that it included a recommendation that affects all of us on data um, to help save lives and to deliver solutions for displacement. And that recommendation was at the country level, DTM's de facto role as data provider for IDP core data would be formally mandated. And this recognition was within the existing framework of the resident coordinator, humanitarian coordinator, and OCHA's mandate to coordinate data. And I think recommendations like this, um, or, or rather one additional thing, the recommendations recognize that the states have the primary responsibility to collect and provide IDP data, but these kinds of recognitions really show the importance of what we're doing together and the importance of each one of our organizations and our effort have a role to play in creating data to save lives and deliver solutions. Since the inception of HDX, IOM has been a huge supporter of the platform and community. We've seconded staff to the center and partnered through thought leadership work, notably around data responsibility. In the 20 years since IOM started its own displacement tracking matrix and DTM operation, the sector has really made remarkable progress on driving the use and impact of data. We now collect increasingly harmonized, coordinated, and sectoral data to respond to multi-hazard crises and, protect, and protracted conflict situations in a variety of, of fragile contexts. And I know my colleagues are going to do that deeper dive with you um, today. We also manage more diverse and complex data, exploring different novel data sources to broaden their meaning and impact. And in the advent or early stages of artificial intelligence and the great potential, but also some of the risks that art artificial intelligence bring, commonly coded and better categorized data can have truly great effects. That's why we're so excited to showcase some of our DTM data for all of you today. Let me close by congratulating the HDX team again and thanking you for convening us today. We really appreciate the invitation. We look forward to our continued partnership in many years to come. And with these few remarks, I'll now hand the floor over to our co colleague, Meti from OCHA HDX to get the deep, dive, the deep dive started. And now my time to pass back the floor. Thank you, everyone. Happy birthday and enjoy the session. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Coco, for your remarks and uh, recognizing HDX's 10 years uh, journey and impact. Um, I will now move on to the next agenda item, which is to give you um, an overview on the center, the HDX platform, and the IOM data sets um, hosted there. UN OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data was established with a goal to increase the use and impact of data in the humanitarian sector. The HDX data, uh, the Humanitarian Data Exchange Platform, or HDX in short, was established in 2014 and um, in the last 10 years has become the go-to platform for humanitarian data. IOM has been sharing data sets on HDX uh, since its first year 20, in 2020, uh, 2014, um, and we are delighted to have them in our data set deep dive series uh, today. What you're uh, seeing playing on your screens is the IOM dataset's page on HDX. 
IOM shares uh, some 200 data sets related to displacement in over 60 countries and territories. In 2023, the IOM page on HDX had close to 29,000 uh, visitors and had data downloaded more than 55,000 times. With that, um, I'll now pass it to Lauren for the deep dive into the work of IOM. Over to you, Lauren. Thank you so much and for the floor and thank you so much for having us and, um, and this opportunity to present our work in this very important day. So next slide, please. I would provide a very quick run through or overview of the DTM uh, displacement tracking matrix methodology and uh, which is the main uh, methodology or information management tool that um, of IOM in order to track and monitor mobility. It started in 2004, and so we are now starting the third decade, or anyway, we are at the end of the second decade, so it's quite exciting also for us how different phases and um, expansion and tools were added and therefore the quality and the type of data available in order to monitor different kind of mobility, um, mostly displacement, but also return, as well as uh, cl in climate uh, related uh, emergency or situation, as well as conflict and, and uh, as well as other type of trends. Here we have some stats to which I will also go back uh, later, but you can see a bit of a, the broaden of the scope of the number of publication, how many of them were actually published uh, in 2023. These are many, uh, 2023 data on uh, HDX uh, and DTM website, how many were downloaded, and overall, how many of them informed uh, HNO and HRP uh, planning process, uh, as well as uh, the download. Next slide, please. We operate in a very great variety of contests, as you can see. So we, are, we have uh, large and small operation, medium size, uh, but the, the, the strength and I would say the unique capacity of DDTM, it is to adapt to the various inform information management needs or partners, uh, data gaps and needs in any given context. In a fully uh, coordinated and consultative process, we are under, of course, uh, the lead of OCHA and um, we try to strengthen the evidence base or uh, the capacity to target programs and other types of intervention in fragile and complex environment. Next slide. Um, as said, this, some of these stats were already mentioned. I would just would like to add uh, that uh, we have uh, different case load, largely we track and monitor ADP movement, but as well as returnees, as well as migrant flow through a significant data capacity. Uh, we rely and uh, we mostly uh, have the support of over 500 technical staff in the field, and these are coordinator, information management officer, database, and our technical analysts, technical profiles, and then supporting the data cleaning, querying, consolidation, sharing, and then analysis, as well as a significant network of uh, enumerators, as well as key informants. Next slide, please. We conventionally uh, mentioned four components as part of the DTM methodology, although, of course, in reality, there are much many more, of course, innovations and uh, um, uh, creativity, of course, is driven by the field. But overall, methodologically wise, we speak about mobility tracking for what matters mostly the displaced and the retired population. The flow monitoring, that is all the work instead related mostly to mixed migration and uh, route based uh, type of analysis and corridor work. Um, registration, that is instead uh, individual level and or household level, and that often can be biometric or not, in order to facilitate the targeting of assistance and different household survey that can go independently or built uh, as part of the previous uh, comp methodological components. Next, please. Overall, as mentioned, DTM has been alive now for 20 years. Um, so 
uh, we have been able to expand and to strengthen the availability and type of data that uh, we collect and share. In that sense, uh, we operate and by now we contribute to several early warning, anticipatory action and preparedness type of contest. Next. At the same time, we also provide key life-saving uh, critical data in order to inform life-saving operation and targeting of assistance uh, and uh, for feeding, as I said, the HNO, HRP, or any other type of uh, inter-cluster uh, coordination tools and um, processes. Next slide. At the same time, anyway, we have significantly developed our engagement in the post-conflict or transitional recovery. So facilitating solution and for all the work related to the Secretary General solution agenda. And that would also would lead to an expansion of a dedicated solution model in our data collection activities. And finally, um, BTM is crucial in order to support collaboration with partners, as well as being part of several technical working group, expert um, consultation processes, and uh, as well as today, as part of the HDX, being part of this platform and related data uh, coordination and validation. Um, on this, I would like to give the floor to Victoria, who will talk us a bit about the very interesting operation in Mozambique. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, and greetings again to our colleagues uh, online. Um, if we can move to the next slide, I will briefly uh, go over the DTM workflow and how it is operationalized at a country level. Um, knowing, of course, that we operate in a number of different countries with different contexts. Um, generally, the DTM uh, workflow uh, includes sort of a program setup stage where we are looking to understand the data needs in any given country. Um, we deploy um, experts, as Laura had mentioned, uh, to come in country, uh, try and mobilize resources, human and financial, uh, to then, you know, fit the needs on ground for um, data collection and analysis. Um, and then at this stage, most critical is our coordination with local and regional actors. So coordination uh, with the government counterparts, uh, with INGOs, NGOs, uh, UN agencies, um, because we do serve uh, as a primary data source, um, as well as uh, a partner in analysis of displacement, particularly in humanitarian context. Um, so we need to make sure that our link uh, with partners is strong from the outset. Um, and then, of course, uh, DTM, uh, one of our operational advantages is that we work uh, with a very wide network of field uh, team members or data collectors or enumerators. Um, these are locally sourced um, or recruited uh, data collectors who have access and knowledge to the communities that we're trying to assess and monitor. Um, and so uh, with this recruitment comes in-depth training continuous um, throughout the years, as the DTM methodology uh, is flexible, it changes to the context, it changes to the needs. So then moving on to the next uh, process, we look at data collection and processing. Uh, as mentioned uh, by Laura, we do have a conventional global methodological framework that sets out common tools, uh, tries to establish some standard definitions that help uh, countries do uh, comparability analysis, for example. But again, very much uh, these tools are contextualized uh, some are mixed uh, in together in order to fit uh, the data needs of a specific uh, operation or country context. Um, and then, of course, uh, with the network of uh, field uh, data collectors, um, um, as well as, which I'll speak a little bit later on, uh, we do uh, primary data collection, but uh, also engage with analysis from secondary data connection. Uh, collection were needed. Um, and then at all times, looking at data quality control, verification and validation. 
Finally, um, on analysis and products, uh, once the data is collected, uh, cleaned, uh, you know, checked for quality uh, throughout its um, different stages, uh, we do develop different types of products, and I, I will leave my colleague uh, Issa to describe that a little bit more and how it's shared uh, further in the presentation. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, a little bit on the data collection methods. Again, I'm, I'm bringing it uh, down to um, how it's operationalized in a country. Um, depending on the activity or the data that's needed, uh, we do have kind of four different types of data collection methods, but there are times where we're using a, a mixed method approach uh, in order to get the best and most robust amount of information um, from any given community or location. Um, so, of course, we've got key inf informant interviews, which include, um, you know, uh, community leaders or sectorial experts uh, who can provide information usually about the area that's being assessed, what are the services available, uh, what infrastructure is there, what are the damages that have been um, experienced, whether from conflict or climatic shocks, uh, for example. Uh, then, of course, we also do direct observation, um, again, with our uh, network of uh, field enumerators that are there within the communities day by day. Um, they can triangulate and confirm, okay, our key informants speak about a health facility um, that has been affected by conflict. There are no nurses in the health facility. We live in this community. We, can, we know and confirm that these services are not available. So this is direct observation that we do. Uh, we also do focus group discussions. Um, these are done uh, often in collaboration with protection experts um, because we tend to um, uh, do focus group discussions on some more in-depth, uh, specific, and often sensitive topics. Again, uh, carefully um, picked for a specific purpose. Um, do no harm. Again, I'll, I'll speak a little bit more on to the core principles when it comes to operationalizing DTM is that at all times we are only collecting the data that is necessary for the needs in targeting or for evidence based uh, programming. And then finally, we have measurements and calculations, which includes different uh, types of exercises to look at population estimates, to look at family household sizes, for instance. Um, that, you know, also help to triangulate other information that we're, we may be collecting from key informants, from household level interviews, from focus group discussions. Uh, you can go to the next slide. A little bit on what data is collected. We look at different population categories. Um, as mentioned earlier by Coco, yes, we, we do um, uh, look at internally displaced populations. Um, but it necessar necessitates us to also look at uh, an affected population at large. Um, IDPs do not live in a vacuum. So when we're looking at the needs and conditions of a community that is affected uh, by a uh, cyclone or typhoon, for example, uh, we do also have to necessarily look at sometimes uh, the host community in the same area. Um, that have perhaps uh, been affected in terms of access to the same services that IDPs um, uh, have limited access to. Um, we also look at different types of locations. We work in displacement sites and camps. Um, we work in areas of high transit or mobility. Um, as mentioned before, we have one specific um, data, uh, sorry, DTM component called flow monitoring that looks at mixed migration flows. Um, so this is really, you know, us being uh, centered um, in strategic transit points, uh, international border crossings to, you know, measure, to measure and monitor travelers moving uh, in and out of a specific point. Um, and then, of course, we also look at places of resettlement or relocation. Uh, in terms of mobility, um, we look at different types of uh, mobility flows, internal, cross-border, um, displacement, return, 
um, and we cover spontaneous as well as organized movement. Again, this goes back to the operational comparative advantage of DTN that works with locally recruited um, data enumerators, uh, uh, listings of uh, key informants who can uh, really provide real-time information of any spontaneous movements that happen um, at any given time. This is particularly useful in uh, conflict uh, contexts uh, where sometimes a sporadic attack can happen and within 24 hours you find uh, that uh, the DTM team is able to collect some preliminary data disaggregated men, women and children of families who, are, who have been displaced or affected. Um, so this also feeds, in, feeds into um, sort of early warning um, systems as mentioned by Laura in her uh, presentation previously. Then, of course, we also look at needs and vulnerabilities that are intersectorial and um, cross-cutting. So we um, have uh, a number of uh, different um, uh, different tools that look at uh, protection, uh, that look at uh, accountability to affected population, community engagement, but also uh, sectorial needs that are commonly found within the humanitarian sector. And then finally, we uh, assess conditions that include infrastructure and services or livelihoods. We can go on to the next uh, slide. So uh, I'm not going to go too much into detail. I think I, I covered most of this process flow in the first presentation slide. Um, so it's essentially uh, just to highlight again, uh, understanding the context and the data needs, um, the players in a country, um, and then coordinating to support the information gaps in that country, um, working with government, INGOs and NGOs. Uh, then it's really um, mobilizing a, a team at a country level to take kind of the global tools con and contextualize them uh, to the country of, of interest um, and to the data needs of that country. Um, then it generally moves into uh, extensive training. Uh, on this, I would like to highlight that under DTM, we do have a partner's toolkit and field companion guide um, that includes you know, 20, uh, over 20 different sectors um, and uh, themes. And then it comes to processing, reporting, and dissemination. Uh, next slide. Coordination and partnerships, again, as I've mentioned before, it's at all stages from beginning to end uh, to make sure that our data is um, uh, useful uh, for uh, the users who would be uh, informing their targeting and their response. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And then on a final note, in terms of core principles, um, at all times, uh, data protection um, is uh, uh, centrality of our work, um, how we collect the data, how we store the data, how we share the data um, is, uh, you know, in key in any context. Do no harm, uh, making sure that we're collecting relevant information, making sure that we are, you know, when we're accessing communities where we've got full informed consent of why we're collecting this data. And then finally, the use of best practices um, global tools, uh, global experiences, um, but contextualizing to the specific operations of that country. So, thank you so much. I will hand over to Isa. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So, this is uh, the overall uh, of uh, the DTM data processing. It starts from the form design, uh, then uh, trainings, data collection, and uh, dissemination. But real dissemination, we do want some uh, quality control here in H2 sites. But before that, the first data quality control checks start from the country missions. Next slide, please. Thank you. So here, as you can see, the first layer, it's the, after choosing the DTM components, the data is collected through mobile application or web app from the country mission site. 
and later now processed and cleaned from the contributions and store in the contribution database. Colleagues, can you mute? There is some, can you please mute your mic? Or otherwise someone mute, thank you so much. So once the this. data is stored now at country level, the data is later shared with regional offices. And uh, we get the data from the regional office. That's where the data consolidation starts from our ends. So once we have the data from regional offices or country levels, we run what we call here DTM data validation checks, which consist in uh, checking some points on the our data validation checklist. After that validation, now we store first the data in a database that we call expansion databases. So, which is nothing else than uh, a dedicated database for a country mission. So, once the data is stored in that expansion database, we pull from the full data set received from regional or country office, we pull what we call core indicators. So, those core indicators now are being consolidated and uh, feed into the central data warehouse. And once, feed, and once we have the data ready in the central data warehouse, that's where the different portals are reading the data. Next slide, please. So as you can see here, once we have the data consolidated now and the store in the central data warehouse, those are the layers that we have in uh, terms of data storage. So the L1 is what we call aggregated figures. So the aggregated figures is nothing else than the total number of displaced populations, mainly IDPs, returnees, and migrants. And as you can see on the timeline here, in red, you have uh, the red square, which is showing you the aggregated, an example of aggregated figures. That's the L1 level. Later on now, we have the L2 layer. In the L2 layer, we do consolidate what we call the core indicators. So the core indicators, it's, uh, uh, it's, indicators that we pull from the raw data that we receive from country missions. And uh, the blue dots, it represent the baselines and the green ones, the site assessments. What's baseline? We could say that the baseline, it's the disaggregated data at minimum admin two level that we receive from the country mission and the site assessment data, it's much more granular because we have the location information, which is the geographic coordinates. And in site assessment data, we do have uh, multi-sectoral information as well, which would be access to services like uh, health, education, or WASH. Next slide, please. So as I was mentioning earlier about the checklist, we do have few fields that we check once we receive the data before publication from our ends. So the first thing is the geographic information, which we call here P codes. So we need to make sure that the P codes are aligned with uh, the OCHA P codes. That's the standard that we are using. We need to make sure as well that uh, the data set doesn't contain <clears throat> personal information, such as uh, 
informant names or enumerator names or email or phone numbers. We need to check as well for duplicate records. Make sure that uh, there is no duplicated data and the data in the final data set that we will be publishing. We need to check the numbers, make sure that, for example, the sum of male and female matches the total number of individual reported and the total of returnees matches the sum of internal returnees and returnees from abroad. We need to make sure as well that uh, we do have a unique and standard master lists. We need to check all the population figures and the most important, the data feed names. Once we checked all those parameters, we need to make sure as well that the data sets tells the same story as the reports. And uh, once that validation is done now, we could move forward and publish the data set into DTM portals and of course, into our partners poster like uh, HDX, for example. Next slide, please. In terms of uh, data sharing, once uh, we receive a data request, it could be internal or ex external through the DTM uh, mailing lists. Uh, the data request could be received from uh, the data management team or through the through the DTM senior management. So once we receive a request, we seek approval first from the senior management. Once approved now, we consolidate the data and then the data is shared with the internal user. But when it comes to external user, once we consolidate the data, we seek approval from the regional offices. Once approved and validated, we could proceed and share the data with the external user. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Isa. Thank you, panelists, uh, for your um, for your sh for sharing your insights. Um, our audience, uh, please continue sending in your questions through the chat box. Uh, we'll do our best to cover as many as possible. Uh, we have about 20 minutes left, um, so we'll try to address some of the questions that are uh, coming in from the audience. Uh, so the first question we have is from Faleka. Um, and the question is, how do you ensure data quality and accuracy in conflict areas? Um, maybe this question, I'll pass it to Victoria or Laura. Thank you very much and very good question. Well, first of all, is that we should always um, remember or anyway appreciate that this remains uh, experimental methodology in very fragile context. Uh, having said so, by now we have also many years of experience, so it's not the uh, you know it's not the beginning, and uh, we have uh, different, um, for instance, uh, several missions operation or operation. Let's say they have uh, credibility scoring, and therefore according, for instance, of which component of the methodology is being used. Uh, there are, for instance, uh, uh, rating of uh, how. Uh, match the data collected from different key informants realign if there is a high realignment between different key informants in the same location then the quality of the data is considered as uh, um, highly trustable when instead according to the level for instance this is an example of discrepancy or anyway um, uh, different between the data point that we can understand then uh, in some cases, of course, you know, we have our enumerators going there. So there are, you know, direct data collection and field visit. And uh, in that sense, we rely on, we trust our staff that you have trained and is part of the team in uh, being able to act as a trustee, or, you know, as a um, uh, reference during this exercise. 
And then, of course, uh, another overall um, invite to all, of course, we need always to triangulate. So uh, DTM data is one of the data sources in humanitarian response, but there are also many others that uh, operate. And so most often, sometimes, is it possible so to triangulate with other assessments or findings uh, from other stakeholders. Uh, these are some of the means through which we achieve that. But of course, we always need to remember that we operate in very fluid and volatile context. And also maybe if the data are mm, correct, or anyway, let's say they are um, uh, valid, maybe after a week, there will be no more valid anyway, because the context has completely changed and the priorities and there are different population groups and different needs and uh, different vulnerabilities. So we also need to keep in mind which kind of contest we are trying to report, to capture. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Maybe just to expand on that um, a little bit. Um, you know, in countries where there is an active conflict, uh, like, like Gaza, Ukraine or Sudan, um, you know, how, how does access um, impact your data collection? Like, what are your approach to, to uh, go about in those contexts. I uh, don't know if you're speaking, Laura, we can't hear you. No, no, apologies, sorry, I had the disconnect on my end. Can you repeat? Sorry, that was a... No problem. Um, I was just asking if you could elaborate on um, the, you know, access constraints in terms of data collection in, um, you know, uh, countries where there is active uh, conflict uh, ongoing. Indeed. If you could you so give much. us some examples as well. Yeah. With okay. pleasure. Thank you so much for the question again. Um, well, this is this uh, webinar or anyway, this uh, meeting was just a drop or a, a, let's say a sip of the complexity of the DTM methodology. Uh, so, of course, without going too further down in the technicalities of it, let's say that uh, many, for instance, uh, the DP data, the one that also Victoria was mentioning and how the methodology was designed in uh, Mozambique, we have uh, different um, layers, let's say, of uh, tracking uh, and understanding the uh, distribution of uh, the population of interest, let's say the displaced, for easy of reference, uh, of the displaced population. And that, for instance, uh, at the beginning, uh, as a first exercise, is when we, what is the, the one of the key characteristics of the DTM, the fact that it's able to provide uh, um, population uh, um, statement for uh, oh, through regular update for a wide coverage or significant <clears throat> uh, number large areas and of course that as I was saying at the beginning we rely on the network of key informants and we define key informants as uh, different representative of the um, uh, our local authorities, displaced population, female representatives, or other type of uh, informed agent that can speak of the characteristics and distribution of the um, displaced population. Um, and uh, this is through the first level through which also we can understand uh, which areas are accessible. Let me make an example. I work in Iraq, I was in Iraq during the ISIS crisis. And of course, uh, there was the Mosul operation that was one of the largest humanitarian operation. And as we know, for long, there was no access in Mosul. And so it was even very hard to know how many people were trapped there and even to foresee or forecast what would have been the outflow when the, the military operation progressively um, moved or anyway, uh, took back control of the city. And uh, there were huge access issues, 
so not only with Musa, but also outside. And uh, then, you know, you try to, sometimes uh, you can have some, you know, more rough estimate, uh, so not validated by the field team, as I was saying, or by our enumerators through phone contact in this case of situation you will try you know to speak uh, with some key informants or, or uh, in a way you have local staff that may be in contact you know with other member representative of the government or anyway trust uh, source of information to get just a sense of what is the size of the displacement and the idea of the dtm that the, through the different tool and usually we, we didn't present on it but this is called emergency tracking and it is how sometimes you know you can get real time rough estimates on three variables you know such as how many where from where and under which shelter type no more than that usually or something or anyway the idea is that it has to be very even on a daily basis if needed that was really during muslim but the point is that it has to be quick and it has to be you know um provide the first level of information and then we through access allowing we are able you know to refine and validate the same figures by visiting you know and then speaking with these key informants and then getting a better sense as well as more data so not just for variables by expanding also the um the type and the quality of the type the quality and the quantity of data and therefore building uh, as we progress uh, a more solid uh, uh, evidence base and um, data um, profile of the various situation but of course um, yeah access is critical in order to have multi-sectorial uh, and more refined uh, um, indicators thank you so much no, oh, thank you so much, Laura. Really appreciate uh, your answer. Um, so moving on, we, we have quite a number of uh, questions coming in, so we'll be going a little fast. Um, so question from Mohammed. Um, how often do you collect data and update your database per year? So just a, a sense of frequency of updates. Uh, if you could uh, touch on that, um, either you, Laura, or you can delegate this one. Look, every country has a different frequency and um, let's say, uh, yeah, data collection activities. Maybe more interesting in Victoria, I would say that about Mozambique. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, colleagues. So, so for example, we do um, a regular estimate of uh, IDP population in Mozambique uh, countrywide, um, and this is done. It's a very, you know, uh, rapid assessment of the number of estimated IDPs and return release in the country. It's done every three to four months, um, and then um, yeah, yeah, updated uh, for specific purposes, namely, you know, readjusting the humanitarian. Uh, response time in, in country based, based on the in country needs that they need a kind of update every three to four months because of the context has changed just quite drastically um, due to the sporadic tests. So it just depends on the context of the country as well. Thank you, uh, Victoria. Uh, so the next question from Elena. Um, to what extent do you work with alternative data sources, so including big data? Uh, Laura, you mentioned earlier uh, mobile uh, phone data collection, but also, you know, do you incorporate social media, satellite imagery, these alternative data sources? Um, so, Let's question me, maybe. This one to Issa, yeah. that is also raising his hand, that can... Um... Yeah. There is a bit of an echo. I would still, sorry, apologies, invite colleagues to mute because otherwise it comes unpleasant. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, apologies, we were a bit out of the grid, so we haven't heard the question. Please, can you rephrase it again? It was and about uh, um, alternative data sources, such as big data or other data sources that we may use. Uh, in our work. Thank you. Uh, so currently, to be honest, we really use less external data sources. 
but recently we were exploring the possibility of using, for example, data from um, I, uh, data from IDMC because they have uh, a global uh, data set which is covering mainly what's interest. It's uh, the sex and age information. So we were exploring the possibility of using, for example, uh, IDMC data in contexts where we don't collect sex and age information, but that's still, uh, we are exploring the possibility of doing that, but we haven't done Thank so. Thank you. Yet. Yeah, yeah, Isa. Thank you, Isa. This is very technical and maybe, but let's, so that, you know, we have uh, explored collaboration with Meta. We have, of course, um, discussing uh, in terms of something that was not presented today, that we have part of our work is related to for forecast and foresight, and even there, therefore, um, uh, uh, you know, big different big data sources. Um, other than that, of course, then we have all our thematic work, such as the one related to climate change, therefore, then layering the DTM and mobility data with different, um, uh, you know, climate related data sources, whether it's soil, temperature, or anyway, even uh, for building models in order, you know, to, uh, again, even here, um, get a sense of possible uh, climate mobility hotspot, let's say. Thank you so much. Interesting. Um, okay, so uh, maybe let's move on to the next question. Um, so the question is from Rogers. Um, it's um, does IOM have data protection or data responsibility officers at country or regional level? Um, maybe Laura, you can take this one or delegate. I would Rob. I don't know if Rob is able to talk. Uh, otherwise, I will cover. Um, but we. IOM, uh, anyway, I can start. IOM uh, was the first international organization, imagine, to issue and um, a IOM a data protection policy. So indeed, uh, we, which currently also is being renewed, uh, renewed meaning uh, updated, let's say. Um, so we have well established uh, data protection principles as well as data protection safeguards, stewards, and procedures in order to share data, you know, according to the type of, uh, uh, of course, uh, um, sensitivity or personal type of data. So, of course, all the data that you can find, uh, this is on HDX, are... Uh, mm, anonymized, of course, also we collect, in reality, the more than personal data that are just related to the registration component of the methodology, we can still have sensitive data, such as vulnerability related or other context specific that can still put population at harm and therefore still needs. We are even been going farther down there, uh, meaning that um, we are leading uh, uh, different uh, the te the technical group, technical working group on data responsibility and data ethics, and therefore even how data is being used and the potential harm that it can be done. And even there, we have been collaborating with OCH and partner to issue some guidelines related to that. Um, at the field level, our staff is being trained in data protection. So it's not, I mean, it's not that there is someone <laughs> per se is, uh, you know, uh, but rather than it, that should be part of all our, all of us, you know, each staff managing different data sources uh, should be knowledgeable and able, yeah, like to ensure the safety and the normal usage of the data. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, so mindful of the time that we are left, um, just going to have this last question. It's from Taylor. Um, so the question is, um, just to reflect uh, from you all um, on generating and potentially using 
synthetic populations in the context of describing, analyzing, and simulating humanitarian related human dynamics. So anyone from the panelists, feel free to, to reflect on this question. Um, well, it's a very, very, um, I can partially reply to that, I would say. Um, all the work related to forecast and foresight, you know, is a kind of a big simulation, uh, let's say, or not simulation at the level of the human behavior per se. Um, and no, I'm not aware of anyone modeling uh, or exploring uh, uh, those concepts, but you know, the fact that there are so many initiatives ongoing, then maybe that also is possible and what's happened. But instead, you know, projection in order, for instance, to understand the, how a certain crisis will evolve and therefore how the, dis the displacement trends uh, will uh, um, be affected or how, you know, as I said, I was saying climate and different hazards can impact the mobility of the population. This one, yes, there are many of these activities ongoing. DTM is often used in order to model as a key data source uh, to test the models of being the mobility that, um, yeah, tracking mobility and providing mobility data in complex and fragile context. So, yeah, mm, but then it's possible that this is ongoing. So that someone would be also been thinking about that. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Laura, for um, answering all those questions, all um, the colleagues for your presentations and participations. Um, since we only have a few minutes left to close this webinar, I'd like to give our speakers um, uh, our, uh, an opportunity uh, to share some key takeaways in parallel to gather some feedback from you, our audience. A short poll will appear on your screens by the chat panel. After you answer both questions, don't forget to click on the submit button at the bottom. So our speakers, um, you each have uh, 30 seconds for some key takeaways or words. Uh, At this point, I will start. I'd like to thank everyone for this uh, time and uh, for giving us the opportunity to present on the DTM. As of the DTM, uh, well, our priority will be to strengthen the consolidation and um, harmonization across uh, the various countries, which are many. And so wait to hear more about this and how best even uh, DTM data can even more share, analyze and use. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, just quickly, quickly. Um, yeah, yeah. So, thank you to everyone um, on the call. I, I, I think uh, from, from a country, country level, uh, we are always looking uh, to see how the data that's being generated analyzed, how it's being used, and if it's useful to partners. So, so it is helpful in the DD data to also engage with perhaps questions uh, coming from other partners, working with data, working in programs, and managing their context. Thank you. Great. Uh, if there are no more um, takeaways or parting words from other um, uh, speakers, um, we have now come to the end of this webinar. Um, I want to express our gratitude to our panelists, Dr. Coco, Laura, Isa, and Victoria, for uh, their valuable contributions to today's discussion. I also want to thank our audience for um, your engagement and questions. Uh, we hope this webinar has provided you with valuable knowledge and inspired further exploration. Um, before we conclude, I encourage everyone to visit the HDX platform data.hamdata.org and IOM's website to explore their vast collection of data and resources. With that, uh, we come to the end of today's webinar. We look forward to meeting you again in our next HDX dataset deep dive. Have a wonderful day.